Every moment of this track has a signature part, separate, definable, unique feelings that still manage to gel together as a cohesive unit. What happens when lead singer Chris Cornell removes his self-imposed limitations on songwriting and embraces his own inspiration and desires? The world gets caught in the inescapable pull of 1994's Black Hole Sun. The song is, understandably, Soundgarden's greatest commercial success, but it also underscores the turning point when Cornell was able to break free of his self-imposed songwriting restrictions. Literally the product of his own imagination, this mental obstruction falsely narrowed his sights on what he thought the fans would want to hear on the next album, what should constitute the Soundgarden sound. So where was Soundgarden as a band? Where were they trying to go? And how were they going to get there? How did Cornell break free? And of course, how did they pull it all together to ignite the billboard and chart-topping hit we all know today? All that and more as we dive into the dark star itself, Black Hole Sun. Black Hole Sun entered the public space on the back of 1994's Super Unknown, Soundgarden's fourth album. It's a masterpiece. A case study of experimental sound design and songwriting that, normally found in the niche subgenres of the expanding grunge and metal scenes, managed to resonate with audiences of all rock genres at a commercially successful level. The Seattle-based band first carved a place for themselves six years prior in the alternative and metal scenes with Ultra Mega OK. The 1988 album, the praise of critics and new fans alike, was a step forward from their small but solid foundation of singles and EPs. The opening song Flower introduced listeners to a band that radiated confidence in their sound. Opening with moody atmospheric chords, dreamy vocals, and a subtle marching style accompaniment from the drums, the song quickly drops the expositional facade and dives into the rock. With success and positive reviews resting on Soundgarden's shoulders, AM Records signed the band for their next release, Louder Than Love. The Soundgarden sound, as Cornell would later describe it, remained true and strong. Washy yet clear, guitar chords and riffs, contemptuous vocals, and of course, those grunge genre drum grooves, which always ensured that songs felt on the move. Standout tracks included Hands All Over Me and Gun, while fans of later bands like Tool or grunge-era Shinedown might find pleasant similarities in gems like Loud Love. Their third record, Bad Motorfinger, is, well, a bit of a controversy. Sales numbers obviously complement the hypothetical bar charting showing Soundgarden's growing popularity after each successive album. But of the reviews from both fans and big name artists that have cited Soundgarden as an inspiration, there's an interesting correlation with either not knowing much of this album or actively disliking it entirely. Which brings us to singer Chris Cornell and producer Michael Beinhorn's dilemma on the outset of their fourth album. Beinhorn was reviewing demos for the next release and reportedly worried about what he thought was a lack of songs that were placeable together in some sort of cohesive album. Particularly with Cornell, Beinhorn decided to sit down and discuss the issue he was seeing, which is when the singer explained his personal view. Right then and there, Beinhorn identified an arguably toxic issue that not only stood in the way of the current album release, but if addressed, could open up an expanse of possibilities for Cornell and the band as a whole. He was really trying to write for like a Soundgarden fan. And I was like, now, you know, why would you do that? You know, you don't know who these people are. You have no idea what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. Why would you try and please people whose, you know, whose lives you don't have any connection with? Like, do you know why they're listening to you? They're listening to you because of what you're giving them, not what, mm -hmm. you know, what they're getting out of your music. Not because you're giving them what they expect. It's, it's completely the opposite thing. They're along with the ride for you. It's not like you have to create the ride for them. It's like, no, no, no. They're following. Do something that's amazing and they'll follow what you know music that you that really means something to you and it was something that was completely off his radar 
I was really suggesting to him, please yourself. Please yourself first. Do something that makes you feel right. And people will want to hear it. You know, I, I was like, what, what music do you like? And he said, Beatles and Cream. And I was like, well, write a song like the Be that sounds like the Beatles and Cream then. And he was like, well, what if, which is really funny considering what, what, what wound up coming out of this. And he said, well, what if it doesn't sound like Soundgarden? And I was like, Chris, you are Soundgarden. You and your band are Soundgarden. When you play this song, it will sound like Soundgarden because you are playing it. It's very simple. After the conversation they acknowledged, identified and removed those shackles on Cornell's writing. The veil was lifted and Black Hole Sun was waiting to be crafted. But it wasn't a resolution that immediately came with the final product. Like water from a dam that had been opened, Cornell still needed to stumble upon the idea, which he did during a drive home from Bear Creek Studio near Seattle. It sparked from something a news anchor said on TV, and I heard wrong. I heard blah, 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 black hole sun, blah, blah, blah. I thought that would make an amazing song title. But what would it sound like? It all came together pretty much the whole arrangement, including the guitar solo that's played beneath the riff. I spent a lot of time spinning those melodies in my head so I wouldn't forget them. I got home and whistled into a dictaphone. The next day, I brought it into the real world, assigning a couple of key changes in the verse to make the melodies more interesting. Then I wrote the lyrics, and that was similar. A stream of consciousness based on a feeling I got from the chorus and title. Beinhorn received the song as the last item on a four-track demo from Cornell. The first track was Fell on Black Days. In its demo form, Beinhorn didn't think too much of Fell on Black Days or the next two songs, but he heard the final track. Recording took place at Bad Animals Studios, Studio X, in Seattle, Washington. Credits name Beinhorn and Soundgarden as producers, with Jason Corsaro as engineer and Adam Casper as assistant engineer. Mixing was done by Brendan O'Brien, and overall songwriting credit was handed to Cornell. The band wanted to record the song quickly, but Beinhorn insisted that they spend more time on it. He remembers thinking that the track had potential to be a statement in its own right. The band really wanted to do something a little bit faster. They kind of saw this as more of kind of like a, you know, get in, get out kind of type thing. And I had a different feeling about it. I was like, ooh, I, I, this really should be a statement. We were surprised to find that Beinholm was very influenced by electronic music at the time of recording, specifically techno music, which he remembers was one of the bigger subgenres around that year. It's all sense. There's a, well, I'm, you know, sample sense. There's a sense of hyper reality because the sounds are so, they're so isolated and you can do anything that you want to an individual sound. I would like to have so much detail on sounds that you can actually feel the space like right underneath the snare drum where like the, mm -hmm. you know, where the snares are rattling, you know, just these little tiny bits of detail and to try and make that come out as much as possible. It just seemed really exciting. Like, how do we do this, you know? Bad Animals sported a SSL 4064 G series console at the studio. Recording was done on tape using a Studer A827, while the drums were cut to 16 tracks, everything else was cut to 24. So Matt didn't record with a click. This is a DW kit. There's Zildjian K symbols on it which I personally absolutely love. They're thick, but they're, they're warm and haven't got that bright, abrasive sound. They just sound beautiful. But I think probably the star is that snare. That's a Greg Keplinger snare. It's a 14 by eight. I had the pleasure when I was working in Seattle um, at a vast studios, Greg Keplinger came in, this is in very early 2000s, and brought in a snare for us to use with the band I was working with. And it was amazing. He was an incredible guy. He came in in like a duffel coat and he had like pegs holding his duffel coat. And I think he drove a VW, a bug, a beetle, which is amazing. A total character. Mm -hmm. 
typical great drum tones that Michael Beinhorn always gets. He always demands the most from his engineers and there's most from the drummers. Every record I've ever listened to that Michael has worked on has had the best drum sounds. Not taking anything away from the drummer, obviously Matt Cameron is an incredible drummer, or the amazing engineering. But obviously the producer is making sure that he gets the best results. And that's something Michael has always done. Except for the hi-hats and cymbals, the whole drum kit went through Neve 1057 mic preamps. Neumann used 67s for overheads. Instead of placing them straight over the cymbals, Beinhol had them pulled back, almost right over the snare, so they pick up more impact from the rest of the kit. So my guess is he probably had them like really close, but maybe an XY over the snare? I'll have to ask him next time I talk to him. But that sort of makes sense, so it gets a very, very good stereo image of the kit. Like, great phase on those cymbals. Bass, of course, is Ben Shepard. There's a lot of beautiful compression on that. It's got a really fat tone. Michael Beinhorn really likes R&B and explained to us that the basis for the bass sound that he crafted was found in dub music. He recalls they used a jazz bass, one that was relatively newer for the time. It was a DBX120X subharmonic synthesizer that they used to supplement the sound. I actually have um, one of those myself. You can dial it in to add some really great low lows. Throw that in with the drums. Kim Thale on guitar used three different guitars, a Gretsch Silverjet guitar, a Gretsch Duojet, and a Fender Jazzmaster. The amazing Leslie guitar is a Leslie 16 and a Fender Vibratone. It's a rotating speaker inside the cabinet. It's more intense than a 122 cabinet and needs an amplifier stage. It's blended with a Marshall JMP 50 watt and a Mesa Boogie dual rectifier. Beinhorn wasn't a fan of the Mesa in general, but when he paired it with the Marshall, he seemed to like it a lot. They used two mics per amp. Each rig had a short SM57 and an RCA BK5. The BK5 has become like the mic that everybody freaks out about now. And of course, there's a reissue made of it by AEA now, which we've demoed and absolutely love. That Leslie's amazing. Just so eerie. So these heavier arpeggio parts were a Leslie mixed in with the Gretsch, but with the Leslie spinning at a slower speed. So you hear that modulation. Thale recalls being skeptical about doing the song, but was converted when he heard the solo. I didn't orientate myself towards radio, so I may have been a little bit more resistant because it was not necessarily friendly to my style of guitar playing until you get to the solo. When you get to the solo, it's like, okay, okay, I'll do that. A solo is two guitars, and the composite is pretty random. So first of all, the riff going into the solo is one of the great guitar rock riffs of all time.
What a great, great guitar solo. I love the chaotic nature of it. A kind of wary kind of wah, 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 wah going on and just this, ah, first time I ever heard that with a da, down, down, da, da, the riff going in and then hearing that chaos had me sold. As Beinhorn recalled, Cornell or Shepard brought in an old PA and they found that they could get great distorted vocals through that PA. Black hole sun, won't you come? How are you getting that kind of distorted telephony kind of idea there? Um, Chris or Ben, I think, brought in this, uh, this old PA, like, mm -hmm. I think a Sun PA or something like that. Like it was old, you know, beat to hell. And I think we did most of the uh, distorted vocals on the record through that thing. Oh, nice. So I think we actually mic'd the PA system <laughs> up. Black Hole Sun found its way onto the US Billboard charts like radio songs, alternative airplay, mainstream rock, and mainstream top 40 ultimately landing the number one position on Billboard's U.S. Alternative Songs year-end ranking. At the 1995 Grammy Awards, Black Hole Sun received a nomination for Best Rock Song and took home the award for Best Hard Rock Performance. Its lasting popularity has seen heights as high as number nine on Nielsen Music's U.S. Mainstream Rock Chart for the 2010-2019 decade, with a specific resurgence in 2017 to number 53 on Billboard's US Hot Rock Songs charts. However, the bright ranking of this latter achievement underscores a more mournful occurrence. Quite in step with the contrasting imagery of vote by Black Hole Sun's name, that year Chris Cornell was found dead in his hotel on May the 17th. His passing ruled a suicide. He had been reportedly been in good mental health further adding to the suddenness and shock of the impact felt by his family and the broader community. Audio Slave, uh, for instance, used to rehearse at my studio and we would see him in the halls and he was always very polite and just a really great guy. And I remember it really, really shocked me when I heard he had died. We did a video on it, but we were a little afraid. We didn't want to cash in and be ambulance chasing. Um, so we didn't put it out immediately, but we just did a, a bit of a video because I had known of his struggles with drugs, uh, as so many people had in that movement at the time, and I didn't know if there was anything to do with that. But we did talk about it because if you know anybody who's going through drug and issues or mental illness or depression, it's really important that you're there for them whenever they might need you and you're supportive of good behavior. And I was really, really shocked to hear of Chris's passing. What an amazing talent. I'd only just been shortly before talking to Steven Tyler and we had both said that Chris Cornell is the greatest, at that point was the greatest living rock singer. Um, Steven was like, I don't know if there's anybody better alive. And I just thought that was a beautiful thing to say, given the fact that he himself was such a great singer. Despite Chris's breakthrough in songwriting decades earlier and the congregation of international community with Black Hole Sun's resurgence in 2017, the singer expressed an unhappy regard for the song's legacy as Soundgarden's lasting hit. That was probably the song with the most ambiguous and least focused lyrics. No one seems to get this, but Black Hole Sun is sad because the melody is really pretty. Everyone thinks it's almost chipper, which is ridiculous. I sure didn't have an understanding after I wrote it. I was just sucked in by the music and I was painting a picture with the lyrics. There was no real idea for me to get across. I guess it worked out for a lot of people who heard it, but I have no idea how you begin to take that one literally. Which is something one might find contradictory. Frankly, I don't find the song chipper at all. And if you remember the video, it was dark. By reducing the specificity and focusing more on the delivery and emotion, more doors are open for people to find their own meaning. So said, for me, I don't find it happy-go-lucky. I find it very dark, but very inspiring. Some of my favorite guitar playing and guitar tones, drum sounds, bass tones are in that song. But it's often that very same self-criticism and doubt which Cornell speaks of that writers use to create such an artistic triumph. Black Hole Song was a focus on contrasting imagery, creating an unreal yet comfortably familiar place that listeners could turn to. And by Jove, did they? This is one of the greatest rock songs of all time. And I get it. I remember reading when I was a kid about Jumping Jack Flash for the Stones, about how they hated playing it live, but they realized they had to. 
And yet songs like Jumping Jack Flash and Satisfaction and Honky Tonk Woman will always be some of the greatest rock songs of all time. And this song is firmly standing shoulder to shoulder with those songs. This is a stairway to heaven. I, I, I said it. This is Soundgarden's it's like Stairway to Heaven. It's Jumping Jack Flash. It's Satisfaction. It's one of the greatest rock songs ever written and recorded. And it was such an incredible experience to be in my teens and 20s during you know, during the 90s and hearing this music come out because I grew up loving all the 70s rock and the 80s, lots of great stuff in it. As you know, I'm a big fan of lots of bands like Joy Division, well, late 70s, but, you know, New Order, Depeche Mode, The Cure, all of those bands were phenomenal because they had a, an attitude to them. But the rock music wasn't necessarily all of my favorites. I loved Iron Maiden, I loved Motorhead, I loved the bands that twisted it up and made it really disgusting. But then the mainstream rock of the 80s, a lot of it was pretty horrific and so, you know, everything's so perfect. It didn't have that edge that we all loved. And then out in the mid 90s comes this album, Super Unknown, and this song, and it blew my mind and it made it okay to love the 70s stuff. I've spoken to many, many of these guys from this period of the, I suppose, grunge period, and none of them saw themselves as punk rock in quite the same way they were interpreted. They saw themselves as an extension of Black Sabbath, and I do as well. I hear Black Sabbath in early grunge, and then when Michael was talking to Chris, he's like, what do you want to write? And he said, I want to write Beatles songs. I want to write Cream songs. I want to write The Who. And he gave him the freedom to do it. Now, obviously, Chris had to do it. Michael didn't write it. But I think that's really great production when you can encourage an artist to spread their wings. And this is what you get. This is the kind of incredible song that you get when you have the freedom to be creative and do what you love. It's an absolute masterpiece. Like I said before, it stands head and shoulders alongside the greatest rock songs of all time. Thanks ever so much for watching. If you enjoyed this, please leave some comments below, any questions you have and suggestions for other songs. Thanks everyone. So long, farewell, have wiedersehen, au revoir, adios, toots, totsins, goodbye, adios. So long, farewell, have wiedersehen, au revoir. Tschüss, goodbye.